I got a full glass of beer and a lot of benchmarks to get through today. What do you say we just dive in? Welcome back to Craft Computing. As always, I'm Jeff. Around three months ago, I reviewed and benchmarked this Micro ATX Chinese X789 motherboard I purchased off eBay. A lot of you seem to really like the project, but there's one question I get time and time again at the bottom of the video. What CPU should I use if I get one of these? When I built the system, I used a 6-core, 12-thread Xeon E5-2667 CPU running at 2.9 GHz with a turbo to 3.4, and at the time I said it was the best bang for the buck when it came to both gaming and content creation. Well today, I'm going to put that to the test. I've got three of the most commonly asked about chips ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the 6-core 2667. First up, I have the 4-core, 8-threaded E5-2643 running at 3.3 GHz, and it's got a fairly low, comparatively, turbo clock of 3.4. You might remember the CPU from my Average Gamers PC build, which I'll link right up here. It has the fastest base and turbo clocks out of the four chips we're testing here today, but with only four cores, how well is it going to hold up? The only 6-core chip I'm testing today is that 2667 that I mentioned. It's a 6-core, 12-thread chip with a 2.9 GHz base and a 3.4 GHz turbo. Rounding us out today are a pair of 8-core, 16-thread chips. The E5-2650 is an interesting CPU, and I picked it up for just $35. It has the lowest base clock today at 2 GHz with a turbo of only 2.5. It may be well suited for workstation tasks, but I'm not sure how well it's going to perform in games that are very single-thread dependent. Last, but certainly not least, is the tried and true E5-2670. Also an 8-core 16-thread chip, this one sports a 2.6 GHz base clock with a max turbo of 2.9. It certainly seems to be, on paper anyway, the most powerful chip here. But at $120 and up, this chip has shot up in price over the last 12 months due to its popularity in builds like this. The 2667, on the other hand, is 6 cores and can be had for as little as $60 on eBay. And as I said before, to me, that seems like the best thing for the buck. But let's take a look at the benchmarks and see what they say. For consistency, all tests today were performed on the exact same hardware, with the only variable being the CPU swap in between tests. We've got an ATX Chinese X79 motherboard, this time with heat sinks on the VRMs, a Cooler Master 212 EVO with fans and a push-pull configuration, a 1TB Samsung 840 EVO SSD, and my newly RMA'd, fresh from the factory, not caught on fire, EVGA GTX 1080 for the win. Memory-wise, I purchased a 4x4 gigabyte kit of ECC DDR3-1866 from a trash can Mac Pro. And although the motherboard had options for 1866 speed, the memory topped out at just 1600, but it did run in quad channel. For benchmarks, I ran a mix of GPU and CPU intensive games, as well as a slew of synthetics, to try to suss out any patterns. All games were ran at 1080p at max quality levels. So, who won? Well, let's take a look. Now that you've had a chance to look at all those fancy bar charts, what do they all mean? Well, let's start with the synthetics first. The only thing that separates these chips is really clock speed and number of cores available. We've got clocks from 2 GHz all the way to 3.4 if you count turbo, and anywhere from 4 to 6 to 8 cores available to each chip. 
The reason a lot of people run Cinebench to test CPUs is it scales very nicely when you throw more CPU threads its way. What's interesting here in these benchmark results is the 6 core 2667 versus the 8 core 2650. They had nearly identical multi-threaded performance, and that's again a 6 core versus an 8 core. But because of that clock speed disparity, the 2667 is a full 24% faster in single-threaded performance and was actually even with the 2643 because of its turbo clock speed. Firestrike Standard shows some interesting results as well. It takes full advantage of both IPC and multi-core performance in different benchmarks. And as I stated three months ago, not only is the 2667 the best value for the money, it actually won the combined score convincingly over the three other chips. If you didn't already know, 4K is kind of the great equalizer when it comes to CPU performance, and Firestrike Ultra really proved that point here. Each test scored within 20 points of each other in the combined test, which is only a difference of 0.002%. 3D Mark Time Spy throws DirectX 12 into the mix and seems to favor higher core counts with the 2650 and the 2670 taking the lead here. Although the 2667 is only 250 points behind, the quad core 2643 however falls well behind the other chips here despite the high clock speed. Unigen Superposition is going to round out my synthetic test. In this case, I use the HTC Vive Max Quality preset. There are a number of results here that will bleed over into my real world gaming benchmark, but I'll get to those in just a minute. The 2658 core lags a bit behind the other three chips here due to only having that 2.5 GHz turbo clock. The other three chips had average frame rates within 3% of one another, but an interesting side note here is actually the minimum frame rates. The 2667 with a turbo of 3.4 managed a low of only 70 frames per second. The 2643 and the 2670 were both in the 59 frame per second range. That might not seem like a huge difference, but in VR and game experience, tighter frame times is the difference between a stuttering experience and a very smooth experience. Moving over to my real world game test, the 2670 with eight cores and a 2.9 gigahertz turbo clock had the highest average FPS in every single test but one. Project Cars scored a slightly higher average with the 2667, although the 2670 had better lows, if only by a couple FPS. GTA 5 shows why I don't recommend the 2650 for gaming builds. Although plenty capable, the lows were nearly 20% lower than the other chips I tested today. Although at just $35 a case could be made that it is good enough. The other three chips I tested showed steady increasing performance as you climbed up in core count. Very similar results can be seen in Just Cause 3, although I blame poor optimization for the low frame rates I experienced here. Drops into the 20s should be unacceptable in modern PC games with any level of enthusiast hardware and adequate CPUs. Doom proved once again that Vulcan loves cores. Even the 2650 managed to stay above 100 frames per second 99.9% .9 of the time. Steady increasing performance and perfect scaling show why people are excited for Vulcan. Last up was Metro Last Light Redo. Now, this title is very GPU bound and we see almost identical results from each and every CPU test. So I threw around a lot of numbers, but what does it all mean? Well, at the end of the day, you need to ask yourself what you're building your computer for. As I mentioned on a live stream a few weeks ago, I don't recommend you go out and buy a knockoff X79 motherboard and expect enthusiast level results. Although I can say you're gonna get adequate results and you can power a GTX 1080 in one of these systems. You might be asking why I didn't test an overclockable SKU on this board. The reason's actually pretty simple. I don't necessarily trust overclocking on this board. There's no heatsink on the VRM, and I've had questionable power delivery, especially when it comes to the USB controllers on this board. I've had those flake out and work sporadically. I just can't get 100% behind this being a reliable product when it comes to overclocking. That said, the benchmarks here show that even stock speed Xeons can be excellent performers in these boards, both in gaming and workstation tasks like content creation. At the end of the day, I am going to stick with my original recommendation on the E5 2667 six core CPU. They're available for only $60 and aside from Cinebench, scored toe to toe in most benchmarks when compared to the eight core 2670 that costs twice as much today. The 2650 might prove to be an excellent value for content creation and as shown, can hold its own when it comes to games. The one thing I want you to take away from all this is if you decide to buy a Chinese X79 motherboard, you are investing in a dead platform. Between PCIe 2.0 instead of 3.0, no NVMe storage options, a max of 32 gigs of DDR3 on these boards, and limited CPU upgrade options, I'd hesitate if I were you to spend more than $200 or $300 on your core platform. That's your motherboard, your CPU, and your memory. 
For that amount of money though, you are getting a very solid platform that is hard to beat in both price and performance. So what do you guys think of these results? Let me know down in the comments below. Drop me a like and subscribe if you haven't already done that. If you have some shopping to do, make sure you use my Amazon affiliate link in the video description. Every dollar I make right now is going right back into my channel. As always, thank you everyone for watching and I will catch you next time. I'm getting good at time with this. One point six ounces. Excellent.